the massive day, I guess, which is the day that Cameron Baird died. I was the only guy with the belt fed machine gun on that job. So I was actually positioned probably 50 to 100 meters from where that contact was happening. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. We weren't out there to take country, we were out on your That was their job. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where, you know, you're going to funerals quite often. Do I lead under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to screw up. War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. It should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, or what can you do for your country. The volunteer for service was, in effect, to put your life on the line. Steve Maharrick is an Australian Army veteran. He was a paratrooper, a shooter in the 2nd Commando Regiment, and then a dog handler within the commandos. He and his four-legged best mate Googe saw a lot together. Steve spoke with Thomas Kay over Zoom about his difficult pre-military past, his career in uniform, and gives great insight into how our war dogs work hand in paw with those in uniform. I'm Thomas Kay, and you're listening to Life on the Line, speaking today with Steve Maharik. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, mate. It's a pleasure. So we'll jump right in and uh, start at the very beginning. What can you tell us about your upbringing? I was born uh, down in Melbourne. I grew up in the uh, the northeast suburbs. Very hardworking parents. Mum is a nurse. Dad was a immigrant from Yugoslavia, and he's a labourer. You know, went to school out there, went through high school, was a bit of a gifted athlete in high school, you know, pretty normal upbringing um, in the suburbs, um, middle class, was into sport and everything during school and and left school in uh, 2001. What happened after school? So you're saying you folks at sport and uh, we know you're a bit of a athlete as you're growing up. What can you tell us about that? I left school without too much direction. I wasn't sure what I was going to do and what I actually like got involved with was, uh, and I have to say, before I get into any of this, that I've got really good parents. Um, my decisions were my decisions. I, it wasn't how I was brought up. Um, this is something that I choose chose to get involved with. But Anyway, I was, I was a bit lost leaving school. Um, I got into, I guess, the, the legal car scene, like doing street racing, that sort of stuff. And through that, I really got into the party scene through those people. And I wasn't much into the, uh, the dancing and the music of that party scene, but I was, I was good at networking. And, you know, the, the rave scene, we'll call it back then, was, a, um, was a, 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 an area where a lot of social misfits sort of gravitated towards and um, underneath that or above that was, was a criminal element. And um, I got pretty involved with the, the criminal element that was, you know, organizing everything. And um, it very quickly got above my head. I, I tell people, you know, there's sort of um, three passports into that world, into that sort of street environment, into hanging around with the people that I was hanging around. And that was um, the areas people grew up in, the family ties, and it was prison. And I had none of those, but I got noticed by somebody. Um, I was just doing this and that here and there. And I got noticed by somebody who saw Uh, a lot of value in me and they put me through a bunch of tests and I ended up sort of, I didn't know I was going through these tests, but I sort of passed these sort of things. And I was giving the, given the keys, I guess, or given access to a world, which, you know, I really had no business being in. I was surrounded by people that were, you know, very serious criminals that had criminal families. Um, You know, they'd been in and out of jail or or all this and that. And um, I was very much a tourist in that sort of, in that world at the time i felt like i was control in control but looking back you know it was very very out of my control and i was just lucky in a lot of circumstances and not something that i would encourage anyone to do but it did teach me a lot about being a man it teach me a lot about human nature and survival and even dealing with with really um extreme circumstances you know i was exposed to quite a high level of violence to people that would, you know, fly off the handle and do do some pretty crazy things um, over very, very little. And within that, you know, some things happen. My house got hit by a task force. I can't remember what year, 2004-ish. Um, I was living with the, uh, the bloke that brought me into that world. He and I became best friends and I was living with him. He ended up making some mistakes and getting caught doing something. And a few weeks later, they hit our house and um, they couldn't give a shit that I was there. Um, they just were after him and they took him. 
Um, he went to jail for a few years. And within that time when he was in jail, I sort of got, I mean, uh, I sort of did, did more in that world and got more involved and, and my reputation blew up. You know, that sort of um, didn't sit right with him. And um, by the time it came around to him coming out of jail, some things happened. Some people took advantage of me. Um, you know, not a guns in your face situation, but just people that I'd, I'd met through him took advantage of my, my trust with them. Um, then when he got out of jail, um, there was a lot of animosity towards me because when he went in, everyone around him sort of, they disappeared because he, he did what he did out of fear. It wasn't really respect. It was really, really feared in that world. And so when he went in, everyone just abandoned him. And um, I looked after him like he was my brother. I looked after him too well, you know, and um, unfortunately when he got out, he, he took advantage of me. Um, we had a bit of a situation and that, and that separated our friendship and was sort of the start of the, the catalyst to me going towards the military. I was living in Southeast Melbourne at this stage, the Frankston Dandenong area, you know, separating from him, separating from that world meant I was also separating from all of those people that were involved with us. But things turned, turned really ugly. I and mean, I moved back to the other side of Melbourne. And in doing so, I, I really made those guys mad. <laughs> you know, I can remember at one point, I sort of just disappeared. And I'm like, I don't want to be around these people anymore. They're just doing too much. They're too wild. They're too crazy. I went and did my own thing by myself on the other side of Melbourne. But um, I still had a few links to those people. And, um, you know, at one point, I got a text from a, a murderer, you know, he's a convicted murderer. And um, he just let me know that um, they were treating me like a snitch, that leaving that world was the same as snitching to them. And, um, you know, I can remember they used the terminology, they call me a dog. Um, being called a dog in the criminal world is like the worst thing you can get called. And it's never sat right with me because I love dogs. <laughs> but, you know, they call me that. And to me, that was a declaration of war. I prepared myself for that happening my partner at the time um who i who had later gone to marry you know we were living together and i refused to let her live with me i moved her to another place and unfortunately i had people that were close to me that were feeding them information and doing all this so you know there was a few incidents throughout that period where you know there's a bit of violence and everything i was i was very lucky in a couple of situations but it was a really uh turbulent few years for me what started off as as i guess a bit of fun and and me sort of just, you know, wanting to prove myself as a man in this world. And I guess that's, that's what pushed me into that adventure was just proving myself against some pretty um, gnarly guys. And, um, you know, it, it all sort of just went, it went wild there for a few years. It ended up settling down. You know, I was still out there, still sort of involved with certain people that I wasn't involved with anymore. Everything started to relax. But by, by, by that point, I'd really sort of become, I guess, disillusioned and, and embarrassed about who I'd become. As I said earlier, you know, I wasn't raised to be in that world. I was very much a tourist in that world. And, and most of those blokes were in there, you know, it's almost by necessity. They were born and bred to be there. And it was sort of, you know, I just, I didn't fit in with them. You know, they, they didn't have a conscience and they didn't have a, any risk assessment or anything like that. I knew it was only a matter of time until something was going to happen to me, you know, either death or jail or something that was going to keep me in there forever and I'd never be able to leave. So you know, at the time I wanted to get married to my partner, you know, I knew I couldn't stay in that world, stay in that life for her. My family had sort of found out what was going on. You know, at one point I got, um, I got caught up in a jail visit and um, some stuff happened. I ended up getting banned from every single jail in Australia. Um, and that note, uh, that, that letter, they sent that to my family's house. So you know, my mum knew some things were happening just through rumours and this and that. And then she gave me a call and she's, you know, how'd you get banned from every single day in Australia? Um, I ended up beating, I was, I was sort of, um, well, the charges were dropped for that situation and I was, I was able to go back into to prison visits after um, I sort of uh, went back and forth with the, the corrections department. Um, and, and that time after that I visited jail after that, I had a welcoming committer, a uh, welcoming committee uh, as I should have. Um, but yeah, you know, everything had started, just just the wheels were falling off and I, and I was really um, upset with who I'd become. My, my parents didn't raise me to be that person. I had better values. I knew I could be a better person, but I really, I didn't know what to do. You know, um, staying in Melbourne, staying in Victoria, I felt like the hooks were in and it doesn't matter what I did, somehow I'd get pulled back into that world, whether that would be by my choice or by someone's jealousy or something like that, you know, that I was trying to do better because 
they want you to stay down with them. They don't want you to leave and excel and be different. So I was sort of didn't know what to do. And, and I started thinking about the army for some reason, you know, I don't come from a military family. I don't have anybody in my family that's been in the military. You know, I grew up on, on action movies and all that sort of stuff. So I was always like impressed by that, you know, watching Arnie and Commando and everything and being an action hero, I guess, always appealed to me in that sense. So I started thinking about the army and what I could do and everything. And I got onto the website and um, started looking into different jobs. You know, um, at that point, I didn't even know there were different jobs in the army. I just thought you go to the army, you get given a weapon and you go to war. You know, um, that was about the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> So I started looking into all the different jobs and I came across the Special Forces Direct Recruitment Scheme. And I started reading about all of the requirements, you know, and it's it sort of lit this fire inside me. It sort of, it was talking about, you know, just that, that higher aptitude and higher fitness standards that they require in order to go into a role, which was, um, you know, unique and, and tough in its own sense and, and, and required a certain individual. When I was reading all the requirements, it just sort of reminded me of when I was, excelling in sport you know i had a, a somewhat successful triathlon career in my late teens and it sort of reminded me of all that all the stuff that i used to be proud of so i thought that would be the perfect answer you know i'd get out of victoria i'd move into state and i'd start a, a a new life completely so that's what i did in early 2008 i think it was i applied for the special forces direct recruitment scheme what a journey already yeah. <laughs> how did it go um telling your family and your partner at the time that you're looking at army is an option man they 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 loved it they like um my girlfriend didn't want that world you know she used to accompany me to prison visits and do all this stuff and she she hated that stuff and my family knowing the trouble that i'd sort of gotten myself into in the world i got they just wanted me to do anything and and to come to them and say that hey i actually want to join the army and, and serve my country even though my motivation was it was going to give me a new life you know there were still all these points you know there was something to be proud of it was something to to do for others and um mate they were all for it everyone in my family was like yeah sign up go get out of here do it is it one of those posters that you saw that sort of started that whole you know, thinking about something different or DFR or can't, I can't remember what kicked off the first thought about the military. As I said, it was never really, I guess for me, maybe it was always this like plan B in the back of my head. You know, if anything fails, you can always go to the military. I don't know, but I don't know what kicked off the, the desire to join the military, but I do know what kicked off my desire to go to special forces. How did it go going into DFR and going down that pathway? It was, uh, it was interesting, you know, I was all in, you, you got to understand, like, I really, really wanted to get out of that world, but, but going into that, to that place and, and, um, you know, especially I thought on the street, I was a somebody and to come into a world where I'm an absolute nobody. And, and that played out when I, when I got to Kapuka and everything like that, but mate, I was excited to, to do something and, and speaking about special forces at defense recruiting and everything, like everyone else was quite excited to talk about it as well. So I quite enjoyed that process of going through recruiting that application process anyway. Yeah. So what happened next after that whole application process, the testing, all the different sessions from there through to getting on the bus yeah well mate i got on the bus and and i don't know who told me or somewhere you know i was like wear a suit you know and i was dressed up in a, in a bloody suit getting on this bus and i look around i'm like god damn it i'm the only person in a suit <laughs> you know so already i was like man i'm standing out already i'm trying to like i took the suit jacket off took the tie off and unbuttoned a bit just to look a bit more relaxed but um, I actually met on the bus, I met one of my childhood friends that back when we were teenagers, we used to skate together, skateboards. We used to, yeah, we used to do a lot of skating together. And I met him and it was just like, it was just, it was awesome. Cause I already, already had a mate. So on the bus there, I had a mate and then getting out of Kapuka, man, that was a shock to my system. Like you gotta, you gotta, I guess, I uh, see like a picture of the world that I came from where I really thought I was someone and, you know, walking into nightclubs, everyone knows who we are and all that sort of stuff to all of a sudden just getting screamed at and yelled at and rushed around and everything. It was a real shock to my system and even getting into Kapuka. And I was, as, as I said, I was part of the um, um, special forces direct recruitment scheme. There was 55 candidates ish. But even the first like few days, they're all talking about things about the military and weapons and drill. I'd never even heard of drill. I didn't know what drill was. You know, people are practicing marching and doing all this. I'm like, man, I'm screwed. I am so screwed. I don't know anything about the military. Um, it was lucky that I had that mate there, you know, and even going through that process, I remember it was a few weeks in, um, I think we went to the range to shoot rifles for the first time and do a zeroing serial. I sucked. 
you know what I mean? Like I really sucked after that. I went, I went back to the, to the lines after the range and I was like, man, I've screwed myself, you know, and I've really hit this sort of low point where I was like, I've left this world, which yeah, it wasn't right, but at least I knew what I was doing and I've, I've, I've fully committed to this new world and I suck at it, you know? And I rang my partner at the time who was my fiance at this stage and said, you know, I've stuffed up, you know, it's pretty much in tears saying I've ruined my life. You know, I'm just, it's all done, blah, blah. And she was just like, you know, grip yourself up. You're going to be okay. Like you've made the right choice, just stick it out. And I learned how to shoot. So I got over that, but it was a real shock to my system. Definitely. You know, um, coming from what I'd been in and who I thought I was, you know, I thought I was somebody, but I was, I was nobody. And then coming into this space where they were really breaking me down and testing me for what I was worth. It was uh, a massive shock to my system. This whole cohort that you were with, were they all going through the direct entry scheme or was this all? Yeah. Yeah. So we had two, so one platoon that was uh, all of us. So 40, whatever of us were, were all um, special force direct recruitment scheme. And then there was a little bit of a f- overflow in the other platoon. So there's maybe 10 other guys in the other platoon at Kabuka, but we all went through it together, you know, <laughs> for the 55 guys or whatever that was there, there was probably only 15 that had a chance, um, you know, and obviously learnt this, throughout the weeks um but it was very much i think that system as much as it gets awesome special forces soldiers through i think it's also set up to be a bit of a trap for guys that maybe wouldn't have applied for the infantry to get them into the infantry as well so it was an eye opener at my platoon um because everyone was so motivated and so fixated it was like it was quite easy like whenever we had range days and whatever and they assigned three days or whatever to it we'd get through everyone through in a day and a half so we actually had a lot of downtime in fact we had a lot of drinking time so i'd stopped drinking completely for for 12 months before i joined and and it was like it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't that many weeks in until they were like yeah you're allowed to go and drink up at the pub on the weekends and stuff like that so i mean i can't really repeat the stories of what that fought all that drinking brought but um It was definitely a bit different to what I'd expected in that sense, yeah. So what came after Kapuka? We went to IET, so did our infantry training, which was 12 weeks. Majority of the blokes got through that. You know, then we went on to the advanced infantry training course, which is run by the Special Forces Training Centre, so run by commandos. Now, when we got to that, that's when everything got very serious. You know, we all thought, we were all trying real hard in Kapuka, trying real hard in IETs. The Special Forces bloke could give two shits about any of that. But when we got to the AIT, how we how we uh, turned up to that uh, AIT course, which was, let me just explain that course. I guess it was like a, I think it was four weeks and it was run by commandos to basically try and give you two years of battalion life in four weeks of full-on training. And it was, it was almost like a a selection before the selection. And that's how they ran it. You know, I think they had a a list of guys that they wanted around and a list of guys that they didn't want around. And, um, you know, there was a, a, um, a Royal Marine, Marine Commando PTI that, that was running the sessions. And man, I don't know if you know much about those guys, but they're not afraid of, of bastardization and doing all that. And, and um, you know, that's, that's when sort of the, the, the everything accelerated was during those PT sessions and that moving into training every day. And, um, you know, we lost, I think half the guys pulled out from that course by the time we got to selection in 2010. Um, it was an amazing course, really did smash you with, with two years of infantry life, minus all the sit standing around and breezeway time that you're doing the infantry um, in four weeks. You know, it was an amazing course. What does AIT stand for? I think it's advanced infantry training. What was next after that? That was selection in 2010. So I didn't pass my selection in 2010. Um, And there was probably, I think, of those 55 candidates, I think there was like maybe 15 that started selection. I didn't get through, you know, I I just didn't prepare properly. And um, I had some stuff going on at home with my partner as well. But I think for me, a lot of it was, I'd come from such a wild world and now I was infantry qualified and you know doing okay and everything i sort of i think i rested on that a little bit and got a little bit comfortable okay i'm like i've ticked a big box here i've left that world i've left everything behind i'm no longer got any connection to those people i'm okay and i think i rested on that and that that meant that i didn't prep properly for selection so i think of the guys the drs guys so again from the 55 five got through on that selection and got berated um and then yeah a couple of years later it was me and another bloke that got through but 
But 2010, yeah, um, didn't have a good run. And uh, after selection, I went to the Special Forces Training Centre in Singleton. And I was hoping that they just keep me around for 12 months because uh, they liked me and put me on selection in 2011. They kept me around for a while, but come July, so that would have been February 2010, come July, they'll basically like, yeah, you need to pick a battalion. So I picked three RAR at the time. For, for To me, in my opinion of what I saw, I thought, I guess they were the closest to SF, being that they had um, they were known to be a bit of a hard battalion. Um, plus, they were in Sydney. That was a massive benefit. Commandos were in Sydney. Three RR was in Sydney, so I picked Three RR. Went there, got there in like July, August, 2010, and I got there at a really bad time for Three RR. Um, they were a parachute regiment, but they were losing their wings. They were told that they were losing their wings, and they were moving from Sydney to Townsville. So those 12 months, I guess, a bit longer that I spent um, at Three RR was a super low morale um you know there wasn't much motivation nor was there i guess any incentive to work hard don't get me wrong there was good soldiers there it was very low morale i got a bit comfortable with 3 rr as well so whereas I, I probably should have applied in 2011 selection and gone straight back onto selection i sort of got a bit comfortable i was one of the fitter one of the bigger dudes you know um just sort of again getting into that old mentality of being a big fish in a small pond sort of thing i was treated well and i had good mates there but something actually happened to me when i was at 3rr that really made me reassess what i was doing I was doing guard at 3rr so you know you look after the the front gate i was sweeping the gutters part of the duty on guard when you're on guard for 24 hours or sweeping the gutters and, and you're not allowed to talk on your phone when you're sweeping the gutters while you're doing guard right and i had mates in afghanistan with the commandos during this time so this is mid 2011 i get a phone call from one of my mates a commando in afghanistan and um you know he's telling me what he can tell me without breaching operational security but telling me you know it's, it's going good things are happening over there and while i'm on the phone to him i just hear this this oi Oi! And I, I turn around and, and I look a couple hundred meters away, and there's this this big overweight sergeant, you know, a guy that didn't rep the uniform well, very low performing sergeant. He just yells and he says, you know, get the fuck off your phone. You're not allowed to be on phone while you're on guard. So I've got commando over doing ops in one here, and I've got this sergeant, this low performance sergeant, yelling at me about being on my phone. I was just like. Steve, what have you done? You know, you need to get across the fence because this stage, yeah, two commando was just over the fence. And that's when I put my app in again to do 2012 selection. Was this up in Townsville at the time? No, this was, this was in Sydney when it happened. So yeah, yeah, I applied mid that year. So it would have been probably July, August. And I think they moved later in that year, I think. Um, don't quote me, but somewhere around there. They were still in Sydney. Yeah, they were, the only good thing they had going was they were getting an Afghanistan trip. Um, and I had a spot on that trip initially as a, as a, as a SIG. And then I had a spot as, um, when I said no to that, I had a spot in heavy weapons. Um, so I'd done both those courses and um, I turned them both down. I uh, said, I'm doing selection, which was okay with my immediate hierarchy. But I think when it got to the, to the CEO of the unit, I'm pretty sure he wrote it on my application that I'd turned down a spot on, on the, the trip to Afghanistan. You know, me as a, as a special forces soldier now, if that app came to me and I saw that I wouldn't see it as a bad thing I'd see it as a positive thing I'm like he's obviously committed you know um so I did end up moving to Townsville when they moved because I as I said they moved either late 2010 or early 2011 and I was just in transit accommodation for like two weeks training before I, I came back to Sydney for selection how did it go cutting ties with uh, three area look it wasn't very difficult for me <laughs> um as I said I, I being in Townsville, it, it just did not appeal to me whatsoever. Um, you know, I'm a city guy and, and I don't see that much awesome stuff happening in Townsville. It's a garrison mining town, you know, um, you can't escape the military when you live there. Um, so cutting ties wasn't that difficult for me. It was always, I guess, my path, you know what I mean? So I hadn't like laid my roots or anchored into three hour hour like that. So take two at selection. Tell us how it went. <laughs> well, much better. You know, this time I had everything to lose, right? So if I failed, I was going back to a unit where 50% of the guys were deployed. 
you know, and it's, it's 50% weren't. And I was going to be lumped with the guys that didn't. And I was forever going to be one of those guys that didn't get that trip. You know, I went to selection, like failure wasn't an option for that selection for me. I, I trained like a madman. And lucky for me, when I was at three hour, hour, because I did have a good rep and I treated everyone well, they gave me all the space to train. You know, I was just like doing cardio in the morning, doing weights. And that was it. I wasn't working, doing much. So I had all the time in the world to train and I trained hard. Even when I was in Townsville, it was during a heat wave and I was waking up at three o'clock in the morning and doing massive pack marches before going and doing PT and everything like that. Um, so going on to 2012, yeah, mate, I wasn't, I wasn't losing that one. You know, they, I'd have to have a serious injury to come off that. And, um, you know, that's, it's, that was just my mentality. And, um, that selection course, the commando selection is a long, hard course. It was back then, I think it was six, six or seven weeks. You know, it's, it's hard and it's long, but every time someone pulled off that course, I was just like, yeah, good riddance. Like I'm one step closer to being in the unit, you know? Did you know anyone going into this selection panel? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I had a few mates from Thraria that were there with me, but you make friends during selection. You know, there was, I made really good friends and I made friends with a lot of the, um, the, the new DRS guys. So the guys that were doing that current DRS, um, cause they're all real high performance dudes, but yeah, I did have some mates with me Two ended up getting through, I think. And, and I can't remember how many else, um, maybe three or four failed. What are some of the stories that you can share from your selection course? So back then you were, you were taken out to a, like an old refugee sort of center um, out in near Singo, part of Singleton. And um, you're living out of there for a little while and you're just getting straight away. Like as soon as you rock up, you do this multiple hour long kit inspection where it's just like everyone brings the wrong kit and you can't do that. So every time someone holds up, you know, they call out a piece of kit, you have to hold it up. You know, people holding up the wrong stuff. You're just like down on the ground and it's all rocks and gravel and you're just like leopard crawling that bent down like a hundred meters coming back and it goes on for hours and hours. Um, you just get smashed and dudes will literally pull off just on that. You know, you get maybe 150 guys on selection. I can't remember the numbers and people just drop like flies and it's not because they're failing. You have to carry around a, a piece of paper in your pocket. Um, it's a with, withdraw own request form. You can't just eat it, you know, because during like during the course, they're like, everyone hold it up. You've got to have it there with you. Um, so guys will just let things get to them and they'll sign that. And, and that's how you lose the majority of candidates. But man, it's miserable. You know, you, you start off with some infantry testing and some like, you know, you do a 20 kilometer pack march and a 3.2 kilometer webbing run and all that individual testing. And then the hardest part is what's called demarcation, which is three to four days of no food, no sleep. Um, you know, no coffee, no energy drinks, nothing, just water. And you're just getting smashed. You know, you're going, it's just set up that there's like four hour long stands where you might get somewhere and it's a, a truck that's, that's fully loaded and it's down a hill and you've got to push this truck up a hill, you know, and then when you get there, if you ever do get there, you got to go back down and start again, or you, you know, you go over and there's a trailer that's fully loaded, it's missing a wheel and you've got to get it over to somewhere else. It's all these like tedious, really painful <laughs> you know, mind smashing stuff. Um, a lot of pool sessions and everything as well. But yeah, the whole thing is, is quite miserable, mate. Yeah. So what was it like when you found out that you passed? Mate, that was awesome. They ended it. So we did that demarcation period. That's get the start. And then you go off and do these field phases and everything. And the whole thing, I mean, you're lucky if you're getting three, four hours of sleep at night and you do a weapons phase and everything. And at the end, so this is six weeks on, they're like, they tried to trick us into saying that we're starting demarcation again. I knew enough about selection. I knew that wasn't happening. So when they were saying that, I was sort of like, I'm pretty sure we're at the end now. Like this is, this is done. And one of the DS just came up to me and he's just like, you know, candidate 76. He's like, are you ready to go through another demarcation period? I was like, fucking oath. And he just, he just gave me this look like, don't worry, it's all, it's all done. So getting through it, mate, like, oh, what a sensational feeling. And then going to eat and doing all this stuff and and um just take that pressure off but the pressure's not off you know you get a few days off i can't remember what it was and you go straight onto the reinforcement cycle which back then was like eight months maybe of just back-to-back -back courses which which can be almost as painful as selection so did you jump straight on those courses straight afterwards yeah yeah straight into it you know you do i think the first course we did was roping you know i remember rocking up to roping course and they're teaching us knots and everything and man i'm looking around and it's like are all these guys Boy Scouts? Because I couldn't figure out any of the knots. So they gave us one day off on um, Anzac Day. And um, guys went off and did that thing. I downloaded this app on my phone called Grog's Knots. And I just studied knots all Anzac Day because I was like, 
I'm ending reinforcement cycle on the first course because I can't tie knots. And I turned into a professional bloody knot tire, um, got through that course. And then from roping, you know, you just go on to, um, you know, there's a close quarter battle course. There's an urban combat course, parachuting. There's an amphibious course, you know, working with helicopters, ACQB, which is the hardest one, which is room floor combat. So, so moving through ranges, dynamic movement through ranges and doing real close, fast shooting. Um, and that's the biggest hurdle for most guys on select. Election. There's a there's a validation shoot there, which is usually what most guys will fail on. And me being a bit of a nervous shooter, <laughs> that I'd had a sort of, I mean, I was all right, but I I still had that you know that fear from Kapuka that you know I wasn't that good. So, mate, on um that ACQB course when we did the validation shoot, I remember I passed the first shoot and I was just blown away that I passed it failed the second and passed the third and I was just like I'm done like ticking the box for that and to me when I passed even though we still had multiple courses left getting through that shooting I was like I'm going to be a commando like I'm done I'm I'm going to get through the rest of it no dramas this was my hurdle so post all your courses it wasn't long until you went on your first deployment was it no no so back then the tempo was was high we basically knew that the majority of us um that passed we're going straight into bravo company bravo company was deploying early 2013 so literally had a few months to prep and we should be straight to afghanistan and you know, during selection and during um, the reinforcement cycle, they made sure we knew that as well, that the gravity of our situation of what we're about to do, that we were basically going to have, you know, very little downtime and we were straight into prepping for ops, a little break over Christmas, I think we had, and then straight on a plane over to Afghanistan. So it's a bit of a baptism by fire in that sense. Yeah, I, I made it through and I got my brain. and I went to Bravo Company and um, I remember I went to Romeo Baton. I went to one team in Romeo Baton, one team being the most senior team and I was the only we call ourselves Rios so until the new Rios come in after you so you could be a Rio for two or three years but we, we called ourselves Rio and I was the only Rio that went into one team every other team had two Rios so I went in I'm like I don't have any sort of safety blanket here it's just me and I looked at my team and all these guys had done multiple war fighting trips to Afghanistan and you know I'd been around murderers before but there was something different about being around these boys you know there's something unhinged about the guys that I knew back in the day that I wasn't very impressed by that there was a to me they were failed with their emotional regulation you know they weren't very smart but these guys were like this was calculated war hardened tough blokes and mate I was I was intimidated in that sense jumping into that team and then I kept my mouth shut for a little while until I found the confidence to start being myself but um, it was awesome. You know, I was, I was really proud of what I'd accomplished to that point and going in Bravo company, you know, I was really happy to be there. What was your boots on the ground experience when you first arrived in Afghanistan? Yeah. You know, flying in, man, it was, it's a very surreal experience going to war. You know, you fly in, you go to Dubai and there's a little layover there where you get some sort of stuff sorted and then you're straight into a plane and you fly into TK in Afghanistan, which is a huge, huge multinational base. And, you know, there's an Australian compound there. And then there's also a special forces compound there, you know, so it's bases within bases and you get there and it's, you know, just taking in the smells and the sights. It's also foreign, you know, I can still know what it smells like now. It was really foreign and surreal. And I guess it didn't really like set in until we started doing jobs, you know, because there's a little bit of a period there we're not doing jobs. And, and, and I guess that the reality of it didn't really set in until that happens. So what are some of the stories you can share from your deployment? Look, quite a bit happened during my deployment, even my, my first job, you know, the first job I did, because I was in one team, I was very fortunate that that one team is ran by a sergeant, he's the one one. So I knew I was going to be on the most jobs out of everybody because he was going to be on every single job. So I got a lot of jobs. And, and you know, the first job we did, we tagged along with snipers. Um, it was just my team and we were reduced to four men. And we tagged along with snipers and we, we flew in at like, I don't know, 9 p.m. and did this massive massive foot infill over the mountains during the night to do a hit in the morning it was coming out of winter and it was freezing and the boys are like man you should pack cold weather kit and i was like nah i'm from melbourne you know i'm from melbourne i'm, I'm sweet with this cold weather and um and also because i was a gunner i was a machine gun i carried a big heavy belt fed machine i didn't want to weigh myself down with anything extra i was already you know my fighting kit with uh water was about 51 kilos um so i didn't want to add anything else and, and we did this massive walk and it was all right when we we're moving but then when we stopped man the cold hit me and I just freezed in those mountains that night, you know, we finally, we dropped the snipers off and then we kept going to where we were going. And 
we stopped at this spot just short of our target in the mountains. And there was about two hours before the sun came up and I was, man, I was painfully cold, you know, and the boys are just laughing at me. Look at Steve, he's from Melbourne, you know, <laughs> I'm just teeth chattering and everything and just praying for that sun to come up. And then when that sun finally came up and we'd gone through that massive walk and we nearly got busted um, in our little spot that we were sitting um, by some, some scouts, some Afghans that were sort of in the mountains above us, but they didn't see us. And then um, the sun finally came up and, and the Taliban had a bit of a shura in the middle of the town, a bit of a meeting. You know, we thought we we're going to engage these blokes, but they ended up get calling a hellfire in. The snipers called a hellfire in and took those blokes out. And we went off to an ambush position. Um, and let's say we were in the south. The, the, the choppers were meant to fly from north to south to push the enemy towards us, but they flew in the wrong way. So my first job where we were in this ambush position or whatever was completely destroyed by choppers flying the wrong way. So they had this massive foot in field, nothing happened. But Afghan was, was you know, that's, a, I guess, a lighthearted story. But some, some heavy things happened during my trip. You know, we had, I guess, four incidents, you know, pretty bad incidents. Um, we had an ID go off during a, a drug lab. So, so when we're over there, we've got two mission profiles. One being drug labs, um, which is led by, um, we had DEA fast operators, US DEA fast operators attached to us. And we had what was called disruption jobs, which is basically going out into Taliban controlled villages and starting fights. And um, my platoon took all the disruption jobs and the other platoon took all the, the drug jobs. And on one of those drug jobs, they hit it. So they had, the Taliban learnt our tactics and they would just rig them up with explosives and piss off. And um, they hit it and explosive went off, took out one of our blokes and a 75th Ranger that was attached to us. That bloke, he survived, but he never came back to work. Um, and he still has issues to this day. Then we had a hard landing with a helicopter, which took out one of our snipers with a brain injury. Uh, he never returned to work. We had another one where one of the boys got shot in the shoulder and in the helmet. His helmet saved his, his life, but definitely hit it in the shoulder. And he ended up coming back to work in a reduced capacity. And then we had the massive day, I guess, which is the day that Cameron Baird died. Um, he was part of my platoon. Most people know who he is, uh, Victoria Cross winner. And um, he was the leader of three team. I remember that job. We landed in, in a village. My team was on one side, uh, sort of north of everyone. If it was north, whichever direction it was. And um, we landed, other teams landed. It was um, Cam's team and another team. And what actually happened was this other team, which was four team, sorry, yeah, four team, yeah, four team. Um, they got engaged and their team leader, who was actually Cam's best friend, he got shot in the leg and in the chest. The, 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 his chest plate caught the round in his, in his um, chest. So that was okay, but he got hit in the leg really, really bad. And that obviously came over comms that they're in contact and Cam, that being his best mate, had rushed his team to support. And on the way, Cam's team got caught in an ambush, um, which is what sort of drew all of us. We, my team sprinted down to help out as well. Actually, on the way there, there was a bloke. I, I'd sort of separated from my team to some high ground and my team was moving through some laneways. And one of my teammates, he stopped and he just said, Steve, stop. And um, I just stopped moving and he started engaging and uh, he actually hit someone who was waiting in an alleyway for me to come off the, the, the ridge line or wherever I was, little mountain thing that I was and come back into the village. He was waiting there to, to, to pounce on me. So got him. And then we, then we moved towards where uh, Cam's team had been ambushed. And, you know, that was, that was heavy. I was the only guy with the belt fed machine gun on that job. So I was actually positioned probably 50 to hundred meters from where that contact was happening. So I was out of the, I guess the fight. So I was taking everything in through my, my earpiece and I was facing basically down the, the creek down the green belt to where the enemy would most likely have a resupply. I was facing down there, hearing everything going on. It was just explosions and gunfire, explosions and gunfire. And I remember it coming over comms that they said, you know, three, one is KIA. Um, and it was just a pregnant pause there for a moment. And then the comms just, just went off again, went off again. And I was just like, man, did I just hear, you know, what I thought I, what I thought I heard. And that, that kept developing, developing. And, and I remember one of the biggest takeaways there in that point was, was how quickly his two IC just stepped in and, and took over, you know, stuff like this happens. There's no time. There's no just like time out. We've got to deal with this. This gunfight's still going. It doesn't matter who's being shot, what's going on. And, you know, he, he took over and, and, we, you know, we ended up getting control when, when yeah, um, afterwards. And um, I came down off my position and just went through and, and helped with the, the sort of the cleanup afterwards and um, a bit of security and stuff afterwards. And I just remember 
going past a few dudes in, in Cam's team and some other guys that were just, you know, that the gravity of what had happened was, was, was in their eyes, you know, um, it was, it was, Cam was a, he was a unique soldier, you know, um, he's spoken about a lot now, but he was, um, he was something different, you know, he was like a, we'll say elite amongst the elite, you know, something that everyone aspired to, to be like and, and him losing his life. And, and, you know, this gunfighting was close enough that we could have touched him. You know, it was through a doorway. It was through a doorway. That's how close this engagement was. I guess it made everyone feel vulnerable losing Cam. Um, and that was a uh, losing him, losing, losing his leadership in our platoon was, was something that took a long time for my platoon to recover from that, that leadership gap. So he's, his best mate, Romeo four, one ended up recovering from his injuries and he's, he came back to work in, in a, yeah, in a full role. With all the high stress situations prior to this, how was it that you and your team handled the intense situations? Like, had that mental focus, that mental drive to be able to get the mission done. It's just, you fall back on your training. Do you know what I mean? Like we spend so much time training that it literally becomes muscle memory. So I think when your brain, if your brain does go into any mode where it's in panic or in stress, it just goes onto that safety net, you know, and, and that's what we do. Up until that point, I'll even say up until that point, there is a little bit of like Superman sort of stuff as well. You know, you sort of think you're untouchable and you, and you sort of need to believe that. And I think the cam situation made everyone realize that we're, we are vulnerable. I know definitely on the job I went on after that, I got shot at at that job. And, you know, I did take a moment, oh, gee, you know, I've just been just been shot at. Uh, I had, a, I guess, a, a moment of fear in that, you know, I didn't stop advancing, but I uh, definitely felt different afterwards. But we sort of shove it down a little bit as well. You know, we don't, we don't really deal with it at the time. A lot of guys go home and process that stuff. There's no time to process when you're on ops, you know. Even after Cam died, we still had a job to do. Yeah, you fall back on your training and, and if you are stressing, you process that in your own time. Can you talk us through then the uh, returning home? Coming back home off that trip, ah, look, I went straight on holidays and just sort of, you know, I, that's how I decompressed. I went away with the mate and then I went, went away with my, my partner who at that stage was my wife. Yeah. So coming back to her, that stage, I started doing a lot of partying and stuff as well. You know, that was my way of dealing with things. That's how a lot of guys deal with things. And that later on got the better of me. But yeah, I mean, life goes on. We come back, we get back into it. The tempo is still there. You know, my company was going straight on to domestic counterterrorism. After a bit of a break, we were going on to domestic counterterrorism. So we had to start our build for that um, leading into 2014 when we took control of the, the tactical assault group, which is Australia's um, domestic counterterrorism team. And what can you tell us about your role with TAG? So for those that don't know, I guess um, TAG is Australia's domestic counterterrorism response unit, which sits above... I guess that the specialist police units being being TAG and SOG and TOU and everything. Basically, if it's a situation that they can't handle, we handle it. But going into TAG that first time, so being a new guy, I went straight onto a breaches role, which is basically a very high pressure, high stress job. You're, do, you're doing making shaped, specific shape charges in very compressed timings. You know, it's a quite a stressful job. But when you get good at it, when you get in the role, it becomes quite good and quite interesting and um, working with explosives can be a bit of fun, you know? And uh, I did that for a little bit. And then I was, I guess, fortunate that I got put into the driver's role. I'm a car guy. You know, I came from fast cars and doing all that. I've got a, uh, you know, I've got a 63 Impala low rider down in my garage. I love my cars. Being a driver, getting paid to, to drive those, those we have like land cruisers that we use, getting paid to drive those fast, going out to race tracks, learning how to drive them fast in reverse, going and using, um, we have bump cars, you know, like old Holden Commodores and stuff that we learn how to do pit maneuvers and everything. I mean, I loved that job. You know, that was awesome. I took a lot of pride in that. I really wanted to be the fastest, the best, you know, it was really fun. Were you enjoying this training more so than your previous training? I think so. Yeah. Like the driving training, definitely. And tag just has this, this tempo about it. Like it's nonstop, um, you know, and you know what you're doing every single week and you're just shooting so many rounds of ammunition. You know, you're probably going through in, in a week, what a battalion goes through in a year, you know, all that sort of, I guess the sexy stuff that you see on the posters and stuff, that's when you do it, you know, roping out of planes on the skyscrapers and, you know, roping down the skyscrapers and smashing through windows and, and, you know, hitting ships underway out in the ocean and, and doing all that, that really cool, stuff that really fast that really high speed stuff with all the i guess you know back then that the, all the money was getting thrown at it because terrorism was you know number one threat then and, and um yeah we're getting all the money and everything there was great little um opportunities to do international engagement so it was really good training then you were deployed to iraq in 2015 during the height of isis's power what can you tell us about when you got that lead in from going through all the tag training to then going back on deployment 
tag's awesome, but you know, you're not going to war. <laughs> and uh, when that came around, you know, back in 2015 and 2014, when we knew that this was happening, so late 2014, we, we came off tag and started prepping for Iraq, you know, we really thought we were going over there to take the fight to these people. And, and they were a level of savage above the Taliban. You know, I don't know if you remember back then, but all the propaganda they were putting out on the internet of beheading people and lighting people on fire and doing all that, you know, they were, they were vicious and violent and we really wanted to get over there and put a stop to them. We, so we were excited. And that trip itself, you know, it was a real reduced manning trip. So it was like cutthroat getting on that trip as well. You know, a lot of good guys didn't get on that trip. I was very fortunate that I did. You know, I, I couldn't wait to get over there to do some, what I thought was going to be, you know, real war fighting, which, you know, didn't really happen that way. But on this deployment, you managed to end up doing some training. Is that correct? Yeah. So on this deployment, what ended up happening, I went out to Al-Assad Air Base, which was, so main FE was in Baghdad. And we got sent out to this, to this Al-Assad Air Base, which back in the, the peak of the, the first Iraq war was like 20, 30,000 US troops there. One of those bases that has Pizza Hut and everything on it, you know, and it sat abandoned. And we went out there, um, there's about 15 of us, 15 Navy SEALs. Um, there was an element of US Marines that provided logistics and base security. So we went out there again, thinking we we're going to get into good gunfights with ISIS, but it turned into a training role. Um, and we started training up the um, Iraqi commandos. Um, so that was our main job, you know, in, in, when I first got there, we'll drive around looking for Saddam's gold in all these uh, old bunkers and everything like that. Um, but our main role out there was, yeah, to train the Iraqi commandos, also supporting air assets. So a lot of guys, to get some commandos that are qualified to talk to air assets. A lot of those guys went to Baghdad and, and started helping dropping bombs and everything like that, which helped the momentum to get the Iraqi forces to actually fight with ISIS because they, they believed in the propaganda and they were really scared of ISIS. It was hard to get them motivated. So once we started getting good effects through air assets, it really helped us get momentum in that war. But it was a bit of a different battle space. You know, we were sort of confined to this massive base and ISIS would, would send rockets at us and everything. And we weren't allowed to go out and get them. And, you know, we'd go out to the front gate to meet, you know, locals that would give us information and whatever. And there was literally, you know, a couple hundred meters away, there's ISIS fighters just standing there, you know, um, but they knew not to directly hit us because they didn't, you know, they could, they had freedom of, of, you know, they could move around everywhere outside the wire. If they engaged us like that, you know, one-on-one -on -one, that it would have, you know, that would have given us means to go out and attack them. It was a training role. It's not really what I wanted to do, um, but we did have good effects there in that battle space. Pretty demoralized by that trip. There was plenty of gym time and everything, but the highlight for me, honestly, was getting out of there. But on your return back to Australia, you made a new best friend, let's say. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is my, I guess, my journey into the dogs. When I got back from Iraq, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And that trip itself had sort of changed my perception of what we were doing and what I'd signed up for, you know, and I'd, I'd sort of ticked all my boxes. I'd get my Green Beret. I went to do war fighting operations in Afghanistan. I did another operation in Iraq. I'd been on the tactical assault group, group and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And, and then um, later in that year, early in the next, a friend who was quite a few ranks above me, someone that I respected, he was in the dog cell and he was like running the dog cell. And he approached me and said, um, you know, I hadn't even thought about dogs, hadn't looked at dogs. And he's like, do you think about, you know, have you thought about doing dogs? Because if you do want to do dogs, he's got, I've got this dog for you. And I think you'd be really suited for it. I think he would suit your style of soldiering. And he and I, I guess, had a similar style. I sort of molded myself after him. He was a guy I looked up to. This dog ended up being Googe, which is now, you know, this is my retired attack dog that lives with me now. So yeah, early 2016, I met Googe and um, I knew nothing about working dogs, nothing about attack dogs. This is a very new capability for us at the time. I'd seen them on one exercise, but the guys weren't really working with the companies. They were just developing dogs. So I knew nothing about them. And this, this bloke just said to me, you know, you're on the weekend, just, just go and take him for a walk. You know, this is the access code to the kennels. We have this own, they've, you know, inside the two commando base is a big kennel facility. Um, it's got its own access, you know. And um, so he gave me the code and he's like, just go in there on Saturday and go, go take him for a walk. I'm like, yeah, sweet, no dramas, you know, just go walk this attack dog. So I've gone in there on the weekend 
in by myself to go. Well, and I'd met him once before, but I hadn't done anything with him. And um, I walk into the kennel bank, I go in there and I get to, to Gooch's cage and there's this 34 kilo Belgian Melanoir just launching at me, smashing the cage, barking, snarling, spitting at me, just telling me like, you know, do not come in this cage. I'm going to tear you to pieces. So I took that warning. I was like, all right, mate, I'm not walking you and see you later. And I walked away and I got to the door of the kennels and I stopped myself and I said, Steve, what are you doing? You're not a coward, you're a commando, go back and walk that dog. So with all the fake courage I could muster, I went back, opened his kennel door, you know, just hoped he didn't buy me, put his collar and his lead on and, and took him for a walk. And, and during that walk, I was like, every time he stopped and moved, I thought he was going to lunge at me and attack me. And he didn't. And that was the start of our, yeah, of a very important friendship for me. So what was this training like once you got Googe and uh, you, you're like, I'm actually enjoying this. Company gave me a bit of space and said, hey, man, if you want to go do some on-the-job training at the kennels before you do the course, go for it. So I had a few months there before we even did the course where I got to hang out with Googe, do all the training, learn everything. And it was needed because Googe was a was an independent dog that didn't want a master, you know? He was just like, he didn't want me patting him or anything. He was like, we're working or leave me alone. And then when we was working, he was constantly testing me for weaknesses, you know? We start all that training. I get used to him and we go on course. The course, I think, was the, the Special Operations Military Working Dog Handler course. I think it was uh, six or eight weeks. But for us, it's not just handling dogs. You've got to learn how to train them as well. You've got to learn all aspects. We don't have trainers. We are the trainers. And at that back then, I think they've changed things now. But back then, we're getting completely green dogs coming in from Europe. No training whatsoever. We start them as scratch and we build them. So here's a lot to take on. I had no experience in I'd, I'd owned a dog, you know, I'd owned dogs, but I'd had no experience training dogs, nothing. So for me, it was a very steep learning curve. Um, I think it was really good that I had Googe, that I had to sort of learn on a dog that, you know, was no nonsense. Um, but, you know, Googe had done a lot of his prelim training already. So he, was, he wasn't a, a green dog, um, but he still tested me, you know, and I tell people it took probably nine months for me to build a bond with Googe until he was completely... I guess my dog and listen to me. And I, I wasn't sometimes fearing him turning on me because that's what he would do. He'd come off a bite. I've got him off a bite, like a bite. So he'd turn on me um, to say, nah, man, I'm not finished. <laughs> you know, and to sit and I guess I had to handle that. And through these processes and through going through really arduous training with him, it was like I had to prove myself to him. And that's what happens. You know, we, we slowly became really good friends. And I remember I did an exercise and we'd walked in during the night, you know, six hours in the rain, it was miserable, did this massive target, um, all were fighting through mud and everything. It was a miserable job. And after that target, I was sitting in a old shipping container waiting for transport to come pick us up, exhausted. And I sat down and Gooch would all, like he'd normally not sit near me. He'd find his own space to sit, but he came up to me and collapsed on my lap. You know, and he'd, he'd never done that. And that was the point where I was like, oh, finally, <laughs> you know, he actually appreciates me, you know, and it took me a lot of hard work and I was doing seven days a week to, to sort of get him to work for me. Um, but it was a beautiful process as well. You know, it's not just a, a dog that loves you immediately. I had to work for that. I've got to ask on that course, were any other dogs and handlers having the same issue? No, <laughs> no, no. As I said, Gooch was, was unique. Um, he, as I said, he didn't want a master. He, he, he needed a certain type of handler. And it's no insult to the other handlers. I just have a, a way I soldier and way I do things that dog like Googe responds to that. Some dogs, they, they don't. Some dogs are much easier to get along with. But Googe was just, he was that dog where I really had to work for it. I really had to prove my worth. And as I said, he didn't even want me patting him. He was just like, nah, man, unless we're working, get away from me. <laughs> so once you form this new bond between the two of you, after all your training, what was next? So that would have been end of 2016. I went uh, with Googe out to my company. I was running Googe throughout 2017. In 2017, I also got qualified as a instructor. So I was a special operations military working dog handler instructor. So I did that. During that year as well, um, Googe got himself a set of titanium teeth. I remember that. Yeah, that was, that was big time. So Googe broke his teeth during training. We got them sort of capped normally, but I was talking to some Navy SEALs in the US and they were telling me about titanium implants and titanium caps. And I started researching this in Australia and finding out what was involved. And I found one vet specialist in Australia that was doing it, contacted him, got quotes and blah, blah, blah. And Googe was, people think I'm, I'm biased when I say this, but he was the best dog. Like he was the absolute star. So anything I wanted for Googe or anything we wanted for Googe, we got. We went to my hierarchy with, with a, a request to get these very expensive teeth fitted and Googe got himself a, a set of titanium caps. 
And I think it was that year as well that he fathered a litter. So we had um, real difficulties getting good dogs. You know, every special forces unit in the world is competing for these certain dogs coming out of like um, the Netherlands and those sort of areas. There's only so many dogs and there's a lot of people fighting for them. And the mistake everyone made as well is they took all the good dogs and they didn't collect any of the sperm. So all the good dogs went out working and their bloodlines died. So there was this issue with getting good dogs and we thought we'd trial a natural breeding at the kennels and um man that was a bad idea so we thought we'd get you know four or five puppies we end up getting 11 we just didn't have the manpower to look after all these puppies and with malinois puppies that are going to do bite training you can't discourage them from biting or doing anything like that so um you know you've got these menaces that are just tearing your ankles apart and you know, we didn't have the guys, are, uh, it's hard enough being a handler trying to maintain your commando skills and look after your dog because you're you're coming to work before everybody, you're leaving work after everybody, you're working weekends, you're working leave, um, leave periods and holidays. So having these 11 puppies as well was just another level. And I, I took them on for a long time myself because I thought I was their granddad. But we ended up giving a, uh, a lot of puppies out and um, two best stayed on, which recently just retired. That's how old they are now. They've just retired. And another one went to the engineer regiment. The rest of them went out to different organizations or went out as pets. I think it was during that year as well, Cooch. <laughs> We had, a, we had a dog wanker come to come to work. So um, because Good again, was so good, they wanted to put some of his seed on ice and use that. We've got a breeding cell that's run by the Air Force up in Queensland, or here in Queensland. So we wanted to use his sperm for, for breeding here. And, um, you know, I didn't know anything about the process, about how they do this. So they're like, oh, Steve, you know, on this this day, you got to meet this bloke. You got to bring him into the base. You know, he's going to collect from Googe. I was like, yeah, sweet, no dramas, you know. So that day came, I go up to the gate and I let this bloke in. I bring him in. He brings, drives this, this van, you know, like a Mercedes van sort of thing. And in the back, half of it was like a laboratory and the other half was like a kennel. And his, his assistant pulls out this female German shepherd which is like the most pretty show German Shepherd you've ever seen. And he gets me to hold Googe, like just, you know, hold your dog, um, just make sure he can't bite me. And they, they pull the, the German Shepherd over and they back it up. So its butt is within sniffing range of Googe. And then this bloke just pulls out this sort of big condom, puts it on Googe, and he starts going to town with his hand on, on Googe. And... Um, <laughs> Mate, I'm just like, what the hell's going on here? You know, I've got this bloke wanking my dog. You know, they call us, they call dog handlers into Commando dog wankers from that, uh, I think it's a South Park episode where they, I think it's Cartman says that, you know, that that, that you, you can jack a dog off and make it loyal. Okay, not true. <laughs> but they, they call us dog wankers as a bit of a joke. But I actually met a real dog wanker on that day. Uh, and it was quite an experience. And then... Um, you know, he left, he took his, he showed me in his little laboratory how, how virile Gooch's um, little sperm was. I was just like him, millions of them going crazy. And I went back down to the kennels and told the boys all about it. And you know, everyone's blowing their mind and everything. Anyway, this bloke came back in the afternoon to do another collection. So I let him in, I go up and see him and he just straight away, he's like, you told all your mates about me, didn't you? You were laughing at me, weren't you? You were laughing about me, weren't you? Having a good laugh at my expense. And so like, mate, calm down. <laughs> like, of course, we're going to talk about you, but no, no one's laughing at you, mate. We're just talking about how much we do your job for. I mean, it must have been his first day or something for him to be that insecure about his job. But mate, that was an experience. So there you go. I didn't know these people exist. <laughs> they do. How did he find out? I don't think he, I think he was just paranoid. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe someone told him, I don't know. I think he was just paranoid. He came in and maybe I was laughing when I went up to see him. I don't know. <laughs> he knew. So what happened after that? <laughs> His sperm went on ice, you know, and they actually ran a, a bunch of breeding with, with Googe's dogs. I think Googe has still got dogs that are serving, still got puppies that are serving now. That would have gone into what, 2018. So Googe and I went on to tag. So this was my second hit out on the tactical assault group. Um, this time I was going in as a dog handler. So this was the majority of Googe and my operational time together was part of the domestic counterterrorism team. So, you know, everything I was talking about earlier, you know, all that cool stuff, jumping out of choppers and, you know, roping down skyscrapers and everything like that. I'm now doing it with a dog. So it's, it's, it's a level of complexity. Um, 
it, it's it's hard. It's a steep learning curve doing all that sort of stuff. And, and the dogs really need to be solid. You know, they've got to be standing real close to explosions and doing all this and it not phase them. So yeah, it was uh, 2018 that was, that was back on team and it was a really good year. I got to really push that capability. So it was the first time my company had really had dogs with them so i was in a really good spot being a senior bloke within my company and, and you know having a, a experience i had a lot of respect so i was allowed, able to put guj and i where i needed us to be and really sell that capability so it was a really good year for me what are some of the most interesting insights or stories that you had from that experience that year we were doing um what were we getting ready for the commonwealth games in queensland so a lot of was just moving up um up and down from sydney to queensland and then we're up here doing a lot of training in terms of, of the interesting stuff you know i mean it's just it's all interesting we're, we're jumping out of choppers with the dogs you know we're we're moving through buildings um assaulting with the teams it's all really fast-paced stuff and, and good was really really good at it um he was a ferocious dog you know um it took me a while to get i guess the guys to warm to him so imagine rocking up with an attack dog to a bunch of commandos a lot of them were scared of the dog <laughs> they'd never seen it but that they, they know what these dogs are capable of and it took me a while to get everyone used to him you you know, showing that, that I was a capable handler and Googe wasn't going to bite them because we do everything off leash. So Googe is moving around the battle space, you know, moving around buildings with these guys. So yeah, it was a learning curve for them as much as it was for me. I've heard a fact, it might be something that you can talk to, um, that generally it's like a one to 10 ratio of one working dog to 10 members that the dog can keep observation on. Yeah, yeah, but even even then, like if it's a good dog, we've moved in platoon size, which would be, you know, 20 blokes or something like that. The dogs are pretty smart, you know, and the really good ones, they learn the way we move, you know, they learn sort of our uniform and you spend they spend so much time with the boys, they get used to their smells and everything like that. So, you know, that would be a fair thing to say, but there's no limits at all. You know, if I feel comfortable throwing my dog in a group of 50 commandos, then I'll do that. What about the uh, the difference between your role when you first went on tag to this time having Googe with you? I mean, it was it was a, a massive difference. The difference, like being a a attack dog handler on team, um, you're running your own show. You know what I mean? It's no longer you're part of a team and you've got a two IC looking after you and a, a, a sergeant, um, you know, a team leader. You're sort of doing everything yourself. I had my own vehicle, moved around myself. Um, there was another dog guy, another uh, dog handler with me with another dog. It's a very sort of independent role. So it's massively different. You need to be good at not just that, but all your personal admin and everything because you've got to, to organize everything for the dog. Was that the end of Guja's career? Yeah, so yeah, 2018 was actually the, the win run team. That was the end of his career. So he was injured on and off throughout that year. We're just limping and stuff like that. And we couldn't really figure it out. And, and one day we noticed some bruising on his leg and he actually tore a, a muscle that runs from his groin down to his knee. And he tore that because when he was young, he had surgery in his other knee and that knee had developed like early onset arthritis. It was quite painful for him. So he was protecting that knee and moving weirdly on the other. So he tore that muscle. So, you know, it was late 2018. So, so we, we knew we were going to retire him at the start of that year, but late 2018 when, when he did get retired. So they could have got a couple more years out of Gooch if they really wanted to push him. But because he, he was a good dog and because our unit does look after these dogs even better than soldiers in some regards, they won't him to come home with a good quality of life so i started the retirement process for him at the end of 2018 when i came off team it was a bit difficult in a sense that that this weapon of a dog was now going into the unknown and he was going to come home as my pet and even getting him to that stage there's a testing process so they have to pass an rspca pet suitability test and they can't fail any component of that test whereas a pet might be able to and it's pretty full-on especially for attack dogs back in the day they used to pick dogs that were quite just naturally aggressive and had bad nerve and a lot of those dogs be hard to pass those tests but for googe he was never just a blatantly aggressive dog he was just extremely smart and extremely high drive extremely confident so i stopped doing any man focused training with him so no bite suits and all that sort of stuff and really sort of focused on on making sure that he was socialized properly you know taking him out to places taking him to the beach and everything like that to see how he was with with other dogs and doing all that but nothing was a problem for him you know and he's testing it's almost like they tried to get stuff out of him and he just 
you know, they do this testing in this room and you can't be there, but you can look through a window and see what's going on because you can't be there to cue the dog on. So they want to see for like any um, resource guarding, any aggression, you know, they use dolls because they don't want to get bitten and they, you know, get dolls, try and take food away. And they do all these random tests, like running up to the door, seeing if he gets excited, see if he gets separation anxiety and Goose just pretty much went to sleep. He's just like, no, nah, this is, this is, this is boring, you know? Uh, so he passed all of that and then they introduce him to other dogs, you know, through a chain link fence first. And it starts off with like a, a low energy dog, older dog until all the way till it's a face to face meeting with a high energy younger dog, just to make sure they've got no dog aggression. Um, and he passed all that with, with no, no dramas whatsoever. So getting him from an attack dog to my pet wasn't a difficult process. Um, it's been amazing for me to leave and walk away with my dog. You know, it's a, an amazing situation. It's really, I'm really grateful for that, that, that I, a, that I was given his leash. I got to do everything with him and I got to take him home. What sort of insights did you gain from that whole process of the sort of working dogs versus pet dogs and the whole lifestyle, the whole everything about that? Right now, you know, I'm training pet dogs and, um, you know, the difference between the two are massively, uh, I'm sorry, a massive dogs like Googe can handle a lot of pressure and taking him home. There was a lot of risk mitigation on my side as well. Like I know what he's capable of. He's not, he's not dangerous to anybody, but taking a dog home and having that responsibility that if I stuff up, I'm potentially ruining the retirement process for everybody else. So I was probably the first guy to take home a dog that was still completely capable. You know, he still could have done the job, no problems. Um, most of the other dogs were at the age where they'd slowed down and everything. Gooch was five and a half years old and still still every, every bit an attack dog. And, and he really controlled my life back then. You know, I had to, I never left him unsupervised. You know, if I couldn't be with him and I was always with him, you know, he'd come to work with me and he'd be at the kennels with work. But if I couldn't, he, he's crate trained, he'd be in his crate. But the exercise demands were massive. You know, it's not just you can walk him once a day. No, 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 no. This is a, a special ops Belgian Malinois at the peak of his career. You know, I had to walk him multiple times a day, do multiple training sessions, you know, to really keep his mind going as well. Because if you don't give him that mental stimulation, this is a working dog. They're going to turn your life into an absolute nightmare. You know, whether they develop neurotic behavior issues like spinning or whatever, or they develop aggression, or they just tear everything in your life apart. You know, it's amazing what these dogs can destroy. You know, once I left one of these dogs in one of our yards and this yard was completely sanitized. It was a, you know, fenced in yard. It had an air conditioning unit with a cage built over the air conditioning unit so the dogs couldn't get to it. And I put this one dog in there and I think he was in there for 10 minutes and I came back and he'd ripped the cage off the air conditioning unit and just tore the air conditioning unit to pieces, you know? You can't get complacent with them. As much as I was trying to socialize him and that, and I always, always still treated him like an attack dog. And even now I still do, you know, I still don't take certain risks with him just because if he was to get out, you know, my worst case scenario is, is he gets out and, you know, he wanders off and he enters someone's house and this person happens to be a dog hater and this person decides to, to kick the shit out of Googe. Googe decides to retaliate. Short term, hilarious, yeah? Long term, really, really bad. Googe gets potentially destroyed and again I, I have I damaged my relationship with two commando I potentially damaged the retirement process and everything so there's a lot of risk mitigation in his life even till this day when he's very, very much a pet now so this was the end of Gucci's career yes was this also the end of your career with the army it definitely changed me as I said earlier doing the dogs sort of put new life into my career and working Googe, that was my thing. You know, I loved it. I, he was such an awesome dog that he just made me look awesome. And I, and I loved it. But his abilities bought me so many opportunities to, to travel and do all this other stuff and be in that space and really excel and, and, and make something of myself in that space. And when I, I lost him, you know, he went home. Um, I mean, when I still had him, I went into a development role in the kennels. Um, so I started basically developing all the new dogs and doing a lot of training, um, training the new guys and everything like that. But definitely like I'd lost that passion for it, you know? Um, and it really, that started my exit. Um, you know, I, I, by 2019, I was also going through some, a bit of a dark period myself, um, you know, throughout these years, uh, my mental health had taken a, a decline. It was something I was hiding from everybody. Um, but in in 2019, that really caught up with me. 
I put in my discharge initially just, just to get away from it all and run away. But um, I had a DVA advocate at the time, um, you know, she said, Steve, you need to slow down and actually put your hand up for help and, and get out properly. Um, you know, do a, do a slow, I guess, detraining yourself, just like Googe did. And, um, you know, throughout 2019, that's what I started. You know, I was getting a lot of therapy, a lot of help for the mental health issues that I was, I was facing. Early 2020, we discovered I had a brain injury as well because I sort of I hit kept hitting a, a brick wall with my mental health sort of rehab, and we found out that that was an issue for me as well, which ended up seeing me exit the military on uh, medical grounds. Early 2020, I was due to leave, and that's when COVID kicked off, and they actually called me and said, "Hey, you know, something's going on." in the world. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're not sure we can facilitate your exit. Do you want to stay in Sydney for another six months? You don't have to come to work just on full pay, stay in Sydney and write out what's going on. And obviously I'd be full to say no to that. I did that. And then when I exited in August, 2020, you know, borders were closed and everything it was a different world, but definitely Googe coming home was, was definitely the catalyst to me. Yeah. Starting my progression out as well. So what does life look like for you, the two of you now? Life's, life's pretty good, you know. Um, when we got out, we managed to, I said the borders were closed, but I'm really good at writing emails and I managed to get a uh, permission to drive from Sydney to Queensland and relocate and do um, my own quarantine period when everyone had to go to hotels and everything. So I got up here, I, I, I bought a unit, you know, I live on the Gold Coast now with Googe. You know, he spends his days at the beach, you know, training. He still still goes out and does training to this day, real, you know, intense. He started to slow down a bit, you know. He limps a bit more after his training, but he still wants to do it and I still let him do it. But but life's good, you know. I, I look after him. I love people coming up to me when I'm doing obedience. I've got this really fancy obedience routine I do with him. You know, he can salute and I can shoot him and he plays dead and everything. And people love to come up and and, and talk. And I love to tell Guja's story, you know. It's on the daily people come up and say, oh, is that a Belgian Malinois? Or, you know, how come he's doing all this and I get to tell them a little bit about Googe and, and a little bit about the reality of how well these dogs are treated in, in the military, especially two commando, you know, I won't speak for everyone, but I did see it all two commando. These dogs are treated so well. And there's this perception in general public that um, they're not, you know, there's these stories of dogs just getting left overseas and blah, blah, blah you know, that they're, they're treated, as I said, in most cases better than soldiers, but now, you know, he actually helps me. So I train, I, I train pet dogs and I, I deal with a lot of the dogs that most trainers won't. So big aggressive dogs or big um, reactive dogs. You know, these are dogs, you put a leash on them and they go nuts at every other dog. You take the leash off and they're fine. Um, but a lot of trainers won't touch these dogs. So I, I train a lot of those dogs and Gooch actually helps me. A lot of these dogs, they, you know, they don't like other dogs. They, they're scared of them or whatever. Gooch is the first exposure to another dog and because he's so confident and so well behaved i can just get him to lay down and i can walk this dog around and get them used to gooch and do my training methods and teach the owners you know what they need to do and gooch is that first exposure where they this dog barks at a dog and it doesn't bark back and it doesn't react back and it it's that yeah that first time that dog gets to see i guess have a positive experience with another dog so he's still working in a sense and he's, he's doing a lot of good you know he saved a lot of dogs from being euthanized very different. Yeah, very, very different. I mean, as I said, it's it's like he's he he keeps on going. He keeps providing. You know, he provided for the military, served the military, and now he's out here. He's serving dog owners. You know, and there's a lot of of, of dog owners here on the Gold Coast that are very thankful for having met Googe and, and having Googe. He, as I say, he's my assistant trainer. So I go out and train dogs, and Googe is my assistant trainer. And uh, you know, he's pivotal to me being able to help these people. Um, and as I said, these are dogs that uh, a lot of them, other trainers said, you just need to get it killed. You just need to get it killed. And um, they come to me and I show them that there's another path. So is this something that you're offering to the wider public sort of for those difficult to train dogs? Yeah, it is. It is. I, I train like all dogs. Um, don't get me wrong. You know, um, <laughs> have to sometimes go train a little sausage dog or a little uh, little Frenchie or something like that. But definitely my specialty is dealing with these dogs. You know, as I said, there's a lot of trainers that won't touch them. You know, there's this movement in dog training these days. It's like, you know, the world's gone a bit mad with, I guess, political correctness, if that's the word. But, you know, they don't want to say no to a dog. Um, they don't believe in correcting a dog. And I'm not out there hitting dogs. But if a dog, if I tell a dog, sit, 
and then it gets up. I'm going to put it back into a sit very nice, you know, gently just put it back into a sit. It's as simple as that. I have to set uh, boundaries for these dogs. And because there's this push in dog training that a lot of people won't do this when they get complicated dogs, they're just like, no, nah, you need to get this dog euthanized or you need to hide this dog away where I show on the other side and say, no, 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 we need to build this dog's confidence by exposing it to stress and, and helping it deal with it, showing it the wanted behavior. So it becomes a confident dog, just like Gooch. Looking back on everything, could you have ever imagined you being where you are today from where you started? No, no. You know, I, I shared a picture once and it was real surreal to me. I, I, I had breakfast with the prime minister and trained with the prime minister. It was like, it was Tony Abbott at the time, you know, when I was in the unit. And, and that to me like solidifies everything sort of from what I've been through to tell those people back in the day who I was hanging around with that I'd then go on to eat with the prime minister and have... I'm really good friends with with secret service agents in the US and Navy SEALs in the US and to have all that like no I, I could never could have written this story about how how it's turned out and it's it's not over but man I've I've lived a, a, a I guess a very different life in that regard um, um I don't I don't I've made some bad decisions I don't really regret my path um but definitely made like looking back where I was let's say in like 2004 2005 and say yeah in, in you know, this year you'll be eating with the, the having breakfast and training with the prime minister, and then you'll be deploying and doing all this and meeting these people and being on a stage show to talk about your dog. You know, no, I just couldn't have imagined it. Steve, it's an incredible story that you've shared. Thank you. And thanks to Googe for your incredible service and your legacy that you left behind with the working dogs. I appreciate that, mate. And thank you. And, and, and thanks for having me. You know, um, it's, 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 as I said, it's an honor to, to come on, have people interested in my story. So um, thank you. I'm Thomas Kay, and you've been listening to Life on the Line. Our thanks go to Steve for coming on the show. For another conversation with a dog handler, a veteran of the Special Operations Engineer Regiment, go back to Season 3 and listen to Rohan Viswalingham's interview, Number 51, Mark Noble. You feel more at home over there than you do here. There, you're doing your job. You're, you're trained to do it. You're doing it every day. You come back here and you sort of feel like you're sitting in limbo. You just want to get back over and keep doing what you're there to do. I also spoke with a dog handler veteran of the Special Air Service Regiment who shared stories of using the dogs in combat. For that conversation, go back to Season 2 and listen to Number 36, Mark Donaldson, VC. People will die. It might be you. It might be your mate. It might be the brand new guy. It's going to happen at some stage because there's lots of bullets that fly around or there's, there's dangerous work that we do. Steve also spoke to Thomas about the late Cameron Baird, VC, MG. To hear more about Cam, first go back to Season 2 and listen to the bonus episode, The Commando's Father, with Doug Baird. So the doorbell rang that particular night. Kay answered the door and there was three soldiers there uh, with their hats in their hand and she knew, just like I did, that uh, he'd been killed. And to hear a 2nd Commando Regiment veteran share stories about working with Cameron in Season 4, listen to number 92, Dean Parkinson, Volume 1. So it's dark time now. Then the Apache, we hear over the radio, the Apache comes and goes, we've got other targets. I'm not privy to everything that was going on right then, but I know Bairdy got straight under the blower and went, no, nah, no, nah, they're lighting us up. In Volume 2. We got hit from four sides all at once, deafening. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Life on the Line Podcast, on Twitter at LOTL Pod, and on LinkedIn at Thistle Productions. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Theme music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Closing music, The Hell Beyond by The Externals. Thank you for listening, and lest we forget. A man sure walks slow, mighty step be your last. It can steal the mind quickly, and it can harden your heart. And you yearn for your family, and you long for your wife, and all that you're missing from a wonderful life. But out here I'm a soldier, and a long way from home, and I gave up those comforts a long time ago. Out here in the dirt, and the heat, and the dry, there's no time for nostalgia, less of blunt as of mine. Just then I looked round, and I caught about his eyes, and it snapped me back quicker than he raised up his sides. He squeezed up some rounds from behind a mud wall as I 
She'd scared with self-doubt My throat was bone dry And me heart filled me mouth As the shots cracked around us I remember the high But it wasn't excitement I was just terrified The steel tore through clothing Mud walls, trees and flesh As I emptied my bag Towards nothing at best And as I crawled forward And I looked through my sights I turned and saw Rowdy Give a wink and a smile shouted with me as he sprung to his feet with his gun up and firing out into the green and the dirt all around him like rain on a pond as he made his way into the hell just beyond Ooh. well I've tried to forget how I've tried Machine guns and fire I remember the dust How the grip cut in the eyes We battled and fought Through the streets, maze and mud And when I reached Rowdy He was covered in blood I crawled up beside him And I laid by his side Not sure it was sweat or tears Stinging in his eyes He grabbed for my hand And he winced through a smile As the din all around him Fell silent and quiet Made in a bag as I licked at a rolly and we passed round a drag. We picked up and moved. We were dog tired and beat. We were the dreaming awake and the walking asleep. As I sat with a beer, looking over the dash, and I drank and I pondered the shit day we'd had. But nothing like rowdy, so I raised up my glass and I whispered to old mate, it was over too far. 